UFC Vegas 95 takes place this weekend, and in this video, I'm going to be giving you my exact predictions for how I think every fight in the card is going to take place. So without further ado, let's get into the video. As always, I like to look at my past week's performance to see what we can improve upon, and I'll say this, one underdog, one on the entire card, I did predict them, it was Sam Hughes by decision, that was a good prediction. And a lot of people on YouTube and Twitter, they went like 12 of 13, 11 of 13. Because guess what? They pick favorites, guys, okay? On this channel, we don't blindly pick favorites. We pick underdogs who we think will win. And Corey Sandhagen was one of them. He got, he got, basically, he got Habibed. Um, Tony Ferguson, yikes. Uh, I, I probably should have just like bet him and put Chiesa as the pick. Uh, Mohamed Yaya, I thought maybe, you know, United Emirates. The guy looked like he was clueless. Uh, Bedoya, I was on Jai Herbert, and then I switched to Bedoya, and then Tululin. These are just dumb picks. We're not doing dumb picks this week, okay? No more dumb. No. Let's get into this week. First fight on the card, we have Stephanie Luciano taking on Talita Alencar in a rematch from a couple years ago in a fight where Talita Alencar controlled Luciano for the first two rounds on the feet. It was um, it was getting pretty. It was pretty evenish. And then third round, Talita basically completely adrenaline dumped, completely gassed. Luciano almost knocked her out multiple times. Luciano got a 10-8 on all three judges' scorecards in the third round. And therefore, the fight resulted in a draw. Now, since then, Stephanie Luciano has not participated in any professional MMA fights. That was 10 months ago. She had a scheduled fight, but she had to drop out for some kind of fever. And the fever she got... Um, it, it's like something that's supposed to like stay in your system. So I am a little worried about Luciano. Just the fact that she had this thing called dengue fever three months ago. And now they threw her into a fight camp directly after. And she's rematching someone who won two rounds on her. Those are red flags. But the reason I'm picking Luciano in this fight is because I rewatched that fight. Okay. Talita Alencar, her striking is just basically like. Wah! Like, you know, <laughs> like it's just like kind of like a. She's not, she's just like a she's just trying to confuse you with striking that, so that it can lead into the grappling. Luciano is more of a sniper. She's a she's gonna be the bigger fighter here by a mile. Her height is insane. Her reach is insane. She just has to not get controlled again like she did in the first fight. And I think she has the tools to escape the control time from Toledo. Toledo is not getting subs professionally really. She has a couple, but mainly she's trying to grapple to a decision. She's like the Walmart Timu version of Verna Jandaroba, and I. I think that Stephanie Luciano is the Timu version of Rose Nama Yunus. So, low key, let's take the Timu Rose Stephanie Luciano to win by decision in the first bout of the night at the historic UFC Vegas 95. Let's find the card we have at Jarno Aaron's former Finn's Hammerlock that cashed, taking on. Yusuf Zalal, unfortunately, I will not be picking my former Finn's Hammerlock, Jarno, in this matchup. Yusuf Zalal's a beast. He's a different animal, okay? His losses in the UFC are to high-level competition, including Ilya Tuporia. He basically gave Ilya Tuporia the hardest matchup he's had in his entire career, okay? Uh, he lost a couple weird fights. Then he left the UFC. He put on a string of knockouts. He comes back to the UFC, submits Billy Quarantillo, and I think round two, and... This guy is a tank. He has good striking. He has good grappling. Jarno Ahrens is mainly a striker, and he has negative takedown defense. So if Zalal can take down Billy Q and submit Billy Q, uh, I think this is a situation where 1 plus 2 definitely equals 3. So I think Yusuf Zalal will get the takedowns on Jarno. William Gomi was able to get takedowns on Jarno, and he does not have a wrestling base. He's more of a kickboxer. So... He was able to get the takedowns. Yusuf Zalal should have no problem doing that. I'm not giving Jarno a very good chance here. I think Zalal, if he fights to the game plan, if he fights smart, if he fights to his strengths, and he fights to Jarno's weaknesses, should win this pretty easily. So give me Yusuf Zalal by a round two submission. Next fight on the card, we have Carl Williams taking on Jonata Denise, and I'm taking Carl Williams to win by the only way he's been winning so far in the UFC, which is decision, okay? Carl Williams, he's mainly a wrestler. He looked at what Jaelton Almeida was doing. He's like, wait, so you can be a light heavyweight, gain like 20 pounds and have a good wrestling background and you can make it to the top five? Well, that's what Carl Williams is trying to do. He's definitely not nearly as athletic as Jailton Almeida. Um, he's a little more like stagnant on the feet. He gives me like Mick Parkin vibes like because he has big traps and then like 
his striking is just like really closed and it's not really that efficient. At heavyweight against a good striker, he could get into trouble and Jonathan Denise is that exact heavyweight striker. He's a former Glory kickboxer. I believe maybe champion, not sure. I looked at his kickboxing record. It's pretty mid. Like he's not Alex Pereira like multi-glory kickboxing champ. He's more like a Cesar Almeida like in the fact that, you know, he participated in Glory. I mean, that's pretty good. Um, Jonathan Deniz, he's getting first round KOs. Uh, I think six of his wins are first round KOs. The mo most recent one is a round two KO against Austin Lane in a fight where Austin Lane shot for a takedown the first 10 seconds, completed it, held Deniz down there for the entire round, and that was it. Deniz showed zero urgency to get back to his feet. He showed zero get up game. You know, he's not shrimping out. He's not finding an underhook. You know, he's just laying there, letting Austin Lane lay on top of him. Avoiding subs, avoiding the knockout, but he's just laying there. And I think that's going to feed right into Carl Williams, okay? I saw people saying that D uh, Lane was able to do that because Denise wasn't expecting the takedown from Austin Lane. But, like, how are you not expecting that when you're our glory kickboxer and your main weapon is striking? You don't think the other guy is going to try to take you down? I mean, Austin Lane got five minutes of control time on this dude in one round. I don't know how Carl Williams is not going to be able to do that. Yes, Carl Williams wasn't able to get takedowns on, uh, where is he at? Chase Sherman. That was a pretty weird fight. And he, he had some struggles against uh, Justin Taffa as well. But honestly, I think Denny, like, we, like, this should be a simple pick. Okay? Simply speaking, Carl Williams, if Austin Lane can do it, Carl Williams should be able to do it. And for those reasons, I'm going to take Carl Williams by decision. There is a chance he just gets starched. He was getting rocked a little bit by Taffa, rocked a little bit by Chase Sherman. But I think based on the last fight, I don't know how you can pick Denise confidently considering he has zero takedown defense. So give me Carl Williams by decision. Next fight on that card, we have Carl Rosa taking on Panny Kianza. Now, going into this, I was all in on Carl Rosa, right? I was like... Oh, she had a banger against Irene Aldana. You know, she, uh, Norma Dumont, she basically should have won that fight. You know, Yana Santos. Uh, I was looking at her record. I was like, ah, I feel like she's an easy pick. 90% of topology is picking Carl Rosa. But I'm here to tell you that that is not the correct pick, okay? Pani Kianzat is going to have the height advantage. She might not have the reach advantage. And Pani Kianzat, her main weakness thus far in the UFC has been the takedown. So people look at Carl Rosa's resume and they're like, oh my God, she landed like three takedowns against Lena Landsberg <laughs> like four fights ago. So she definitely has wrestling in her back pocket. Well, the only people that are really controlling Panny like that is Macy Chiazon, Ketlin Vieira, and Raquel Pennington. And I watched all three of those fights. And in all three of those, besides the Chiazon one, Panny has good get-ups. You know, she's able to reverse the clinch against the cage against a girl like Raquel Pennington, who she brought to the brink low key, who is the current champ. And then Caitlin Vieira just had her way at, like with the takedowns, but I don't think Carl Rosa is going to sell out for that. Carl Rosa is more of a leg striker. She's more of a press you up against the cage and just have her way with you. When it comes to clinch, I think Panny Kianza will be better in the clinch. And I think 90% of this fight will take place in the clinch against the cage. If you watch the Yana Santos fight versus Carl Rosa, a lot of the first two rounds was just clinched against the cage and Yana Santos was winning. I don't know how Yana Santos lost that fight. I think she would have sh should have won the first two rounds cleanly. But if it comes down to damage, I potentially can see Rosa, you know, out-voluming Panny because she's landing more leg kicks. But Panny has this strange style where she charges in and she looks like she's landing big shots. Her, she's a little chinny. She did get knocked down by Lena Landsberg. That is a concern. But other than that, Carl Rosa needs to sell out for takedowns to win. Carl Rosa needs to vis visibly damage Panny Kianza to win. Or she needs to out-volume her with leg kicks, which is a dangerous strategy in a smaller apex cage. So for those reasons, I think Panny, as the plus currently plus 190 underdog, is a very solid play to make at UFC Vegas 95. Number one, it's contrarian. Everybody and their mom is on Carl Rosa. Parlaying minus 250, Carl Rosa. Yeah, I'm sure that's plus EV. You know, coming from the king of minus EV. I think that's minus EV, all right? So... 
in a coin flippy women's matchup that's 99% of the time going to go to decision, 99% of the fight will be taking place in the 50-50 clinch, I'm going to take the plus 190, give me Penny Keons out by decision. I would think that this video might be shorter because there's only 10 fights, but I am waxing poetic about all of these fights. Next one, we got Charlampos Gregorio taking on Toshiomi Kazama, and I'll keep this breakdown short. Um, Gregorio's gonna get a finish here, guys, okay? He trains with Aljo, he trains with Marab. He has the takedown defense in his back pocket. I know Chad Evan Helliger was able to get some takedowns on him, but that was because he got gassed in the later rounds. And that was because he himself, Charlampos, decided to be a takedown artist in a fight where he needed to strike to win. And in all his other performances, you don't really see him being a takedown artist. It might have been because he went to the Ray Longo gym and they're like, oh, let's mix in a takedown. So maybe he wasn't used to that type of fight style. He took a long time off. That fight took place four months ago. That's not a long time off. <laughs> Whoops. And then he's taking on Toshiomi Kazama, who has zero quality wins. Let's look at his last five. Road to the UFC. And then a road, not even road to the UFC. Three losses. Flying knee in the first round. Yikes. Rinya Nakamura, who's a wrestling guy. Knockout round one. Yikes. Garrett Armfield, who's not really knocking out anyone, round one KO. Not good. Charlampos is actually knocking people out. That Cameron Smotherman KO on the Contender Series made me pick Charlampos against Chad and Helliger. And I'm going to use that same logic and pick him against Toshiomi. Toshiomi's mainly a grappler. He has like negative striking skill that I've seen. No offense. He is in the UFC. He probably beat me, but Charlampos... He's got that bouncy style. He has heavy power. That's all I need to see. Give me Charlon Pesagoryu, round one KO. Next fight on the card, we have Yana Santos taking on Chelsea Chandler. And it is a little concerning that the plus 105 underdog is being picked 77% of the time. And I'm on it. It seems like a sheep play. But I'm going to give you some reasoning why. So Chelsea Chandler, I feel like her stock is up. She did look very uh, weird against Norma Dumont in the opening round. But if you watch back the Norma Dumont fight, I mean, Chelsea Chandler was able to win at least a round on the judges' scorecards in the later rounds. She uh, outlasted the initial onslaught of Norma Dumont, and she was able to make it a respectable decision loss. Then she takes on Josie Nunez, who's like five feet shorter than her, and she's able to control her and clinch her against the cage. Now the UFC is giving her someone who is 35 years old. I thought she was older than that, to be honest. And she is coming off having, a, you know, some children. And honestly, I'm not a big fan of the style of Yana Santos. She will look like the more muscular lady in this fight. She will be exactly the same size, according to these stats. And I think this fight is going to be a boring clinch fest, just similar to the Kianzad Carol Rosa fight. I think this is most likely going to decision. Yana Santos has been knocked out a few times in her career, even recently. And Chelsea Chandler, low-key, is knocking women out. Rear naked choke, ground and pound. I mean, she's getting some finishes, so she's not completely terrible. So, I mean, there is a world where Chelsea Chandler gets the knockout. Uh, Yana Santos basically needs to out-clinch Chelsea to win this, and I simply don't think she will be able to out-muscle Chelsea for all three rounds. Yana Santos has a very jumpy, stay-on-the-outside style, similar to Israel Adesanya. Now, I did just compare Yana Santos to Israel Adesanya, but uh, yeah, that's kind of how she fights, but it's not necessarily a good strategy because you look like you're losing to the judges because you're on the back foot. You're constantly moving around your opponent against the cage. All Chelsea needs to do is just tackle her against the cage, hold her, and she wins that portion of the fight. I think she just has to rinse, repeat that, and win. Clinch against the cage, out-clinch Yana, maybe land some takedowns, screw it. Maybe land some big... Boom! I think Chelsea Chandler is very live in this fight. I think people are overrating that one Norma Dumont clip because she low-key... Could have won that fight. Rounds two and three were very close. Give me Chelsea Chandler by decision. And I have a unit on it too. Oh God, this is this is disgusting. 75% oh, on topology. That's bad. That's bad. Chelsea Chandler by decision. <laughs> Next fight on the card, we have Chris Gutierrez taking on Kang Bang Lee. 
And honestly, I really want to take Kang Lee. I need every reason to fade Chris Gutierrez. Chris Gutierrez is like a minus 550 favorite. Kang Lee is taking this fight on a week's notice. He's supposed to fight on the Contender Series in a month. So he was already pretty good. I went back and I watched the tape of Kang Lee. Uh, pretty good knockouts. He had a good uh, left hook knockout against Tiao Tang. He was landing good leg kicks in that fight. He had a good knockout against Cody Peterson. Both these guys had pretty good records. And both of these fights were high up on the LFA card in that event. So, he does have some potential to him. Now, I could nitpick Chris Gutierrez, okay? He has zero grappling to his name, okay? If this fight turns into a grapple fest, Kang Lee is going to win the minutes on the mat. If this fight gets taken place against, against the cage, I think Kang Lee will win the minutes against the cage. I don't know why I'm picking Chris Gutierrez. His wins in the UFC, of the eight wins, seven of them are to people who have been cut or they have retired. He has one win in the UFC that's against someone who's currently in the UFC. Okay? And his losses are losses where he gets taken down. His losses are losses where the other guy finds the spot early on and just has more power than Gutierrez. I think Kang Lee can do both of those things. But, like, how dumb would it be to pick Kang Lee? <laughs> I don't want to do it. I really don't. But I don't see how Chris Gutierrez is going to support his minus 560 price tag. His main attack is leg kicks. I picked Penny Kianzat because Carl Rosas made an attack as leg kicks. Leg kickers are dying in MMA. If that's all you do, I pick. I bet on the Kello that Jake took round one KO against Shara because all he does is leg kick. It's not a good strategy. Minus 560 is absurd. I, I, and Kang Lee has good takedowns, good grappling, good wrestling. What I've seen, he does come from Vietnam, which means that his gym is not a well-known gym. But all the intangibles, all the tape study points me in the direction of placing a bet on Kang Lee. But for topology reasons and for my own sanity... I can't do it. I just can't do it. It would be so dumb. This guy is ranked. Chris Gutierrez is ranked. And I'm going to take an unsigned, unproven Dana White Contender Series wannabe just because he's 8 0. I can't. Zero confidence. I actually might end up coming around to putting some money on Kang Lee. But for the purpose of keeping my reputation intact on Tabology, on Instagram, and X, I have to take. <sighs> Chris Gutierrez by decision. Next fight in the card, we have Danny Barlow taking on Nikolai Veretenikov. Um, Okay, so I watched back some of Veretenikov's fights because he is the plus 300 underdog. Whenever I see an underdog that high, I'm like, oh my god. If I watch the tape, I have to pick up on something that might make me want to bet them. And honestly, no. Uh, <laughs> Veretenikov, so he started his career 1-3. and three. He has been 11-1 and one since. And his only loss was to Michael Morales. And the only reason he lost to Michael Morales is because Michael Morales decided to become a takedown artist. He, Michael Morales isn't shooting takedowns in any fight since the, his contender series fight. He's mainly a striker. And it turns out that when he struck with Nikolai, he wasn't liking what he was feeling. But at the same time, we're talking about Danny Barlow here, okay? This is a very good up-and-coming prospect in the UFC. His nickname is Left Hand to God because his left hand sends everyone to the shadow realm. Um, his style is very athletic. He's constantly bouncing. He has wrestling in his back pocket because he has a, he went he did high, uh, he did wrestling in high school. So if Nikolai if Nikolai were to win this, he would probably have to utilize takedowns, and that is negated because Barlow has good anti grappling, anti wrestling in his back pocket. So then that leads us to think that Nikolai has to outstrike or KO Danny Barlow. Well, the thing is, Danny Barlow has good striking defense as well. I've yet to see him rocked or wobbled in any of the fights. I taped for him so that's a concern as well for picking the dog here and Danny Barlow he might not have gotten a round one KO on Josh Quinlan but he got a round two KO and the only reason that it happened like that is because he broke his hand in the first round suckered it out and got the finish anyway John Silva style so for all those reasons Danny Barlow being a dog he's gonna fight for your money Danny Barlow having good uh wrestling defense that I I think based on what I think and Nikolai not really showing me anything super jumpy off the page. Yes, he has a lot of finishes, but it's against low-level regional comp. 
for all those reasons, you got to go with the big favorite. You got to pick Danny Barlow for betting purposes. That's when it gets a little tricky. Do you want to put Barlow in a parlay? Do you want to bet Barlow by KO at plus 130? I don't know if that's EV. I think I'm just going to stay away from this one for betting. But Danny Barlow is a pretty confident pick of mine, and I'm going to do round two KO. Next fight on that card, we have Chepe Mariscal taking on Damon Jackson. Now, yes, this is where I will pick the big underdog, Damon Jackson. Yes. Okay, let's get into it. Damon Jackson is pretty chinny, all right? He's been knocked out a couple times in the UFC, but granted, it was the people that are, you know, knockout artists. Uh, Dan Ige uh, got a good knockout. Billy Quarantillo beat him because he was able to neutralize the grappling and wrestling. But then you look at the Alexander Hernandez decision win, and in that fight, he actually got knocked down. But he outlasted the knockdown, was able to outdog Hernandez, with the grappling, with the wrestling, and he was able to win the decision on the scorecards. Now, has Chepe really shown a proclivity to get taken down? Well, yes and no. There are a few fights where he has conceded takedowns. He's conceded multiple minutes of control time. That definitely has happened. Damon Jackson will have the bigger reach here. Jamin Jackson will be the taller fighter here. He should be, in theory, the stronger fighter as well. Damon Jackson has that re recent Turkish hairline. So with that in mind, I don't know how you can possibly fade the guy. <laughs> no, I'm saying Chepe has fought good guys on the regional scene as well. A couple of the guys he fought are now in the UFC. He has racked up a few good wins recently. Uh, the Jack Jenkins one, kind of strange because he tried to do like a judo toss on Jenkins. Jenkins put his arm out, broke his arm. I don't know what you can take from that. Trevor Peak, people roast Trevor Peak. And then we people look at this and they're like, oh, he beat Trevor Peak. Guys, you were sh... sh Poo-pooing Trevor Peak last week when we broke down Muhammad Yaya. But then we look at the win here for Chepe and we're like, oh, Chepe, he's still good. Chepe was the underdog to Trevor Peak, okay? Plus 180. And then he beats Jack Jenkins because he breaks his arm. He wins very barely against Morgan Charrier. And now all of a sudden we're expected to believe that Chepe should deserve to be minus 250? I'm not buying it. I think Damon Jackson... His striking is a little left to be desired, but Chepe is not really a volume striker. Chepe is not really knocking people out at the UFC level, so Chepe is going to need to out-volume Damon and avoid the takedowns, and I think in a smaller apex cage, Damon is going to have his way with Chepe on the ground. There have been multiple fights with Damon getting 10-plus minutes of control time. This could be another one of those. He can even take the back of Chepe standing up because he's just taller than him. Just put your... Just put your limbs around them. Just monkey them. You know what I'm saying? Just... <laughs> okay, anyways, for those reasons, I think Damon Jackson is just too high of an underdog. I'm surprised the line hasn't moved. Like, it opened at around here, and it stayed around plus 200. So I'm a little confused by that. Maybe people just aren't seeing the value like I am. Give me Damon Jackson by decision. And that brings us to the main event of the greatest card in the history of the UFC. UFC Vegas 95, the main event is a rematch between Marcin Tybora and Sergei Spivak. We started with a rematch with Stephanie Luciano and Talita Alencar, and we are bookending this fantastic card with Marcin Tybora versus Sergei Spivak in a rematch. So, since their, since their last fight, since they fought the first time, Tybora is 6-2, Spivak is 7-2, and, and their losses are to Tom Aspinall. Both of them lost to Tom Aspinall very, very fast. Um, and Tybora also lost to, who was it? Alexander Volkov, but he's Swolkov now, so I'll give him a pass. And Sergey lost to, I think, Cyril Gan in his last fight. So, I'm not sure how you can take Sergey here, okay? Sergey uh, does have 30 more pounds than... He did when he fought Tybura the first time. Uh, Sergey might have, uh, you know, improved his striking a little bit from the first time. And Sergey is also nine years younger with the same height and reach. So people, I think, are looking at Sergey's uh, intangibles and determining that he's going to win the fight that way. He's going to win the fight by being younger. He's going to win the fight by uh, losing to Cyril Gan. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. I'm not really seeing, like, people predict exactly... So. Is Spivak going to knock out Tybora? That is a very fat chance. He's not knocking people out anyway at the UFC level. And if he is, it's because he got the takedown. 
And when he tried to do takedowns on Tybora in the first fight, completely failed, got reversed, and Tybora was the one taking him down. Tybora was the one controlling speed like against the cage. Do you think 30 extra pounds is going to negate that? Because that's the only difference from now and then. Spivak was like 25 then, and he's 29 now. He, you know, he might have learned some things in his last few years. But ultimately, I haven't seen anything in the Spivak fights from then that would make me think he's going to fight any differently now. And this is a five-rounder. I think Tybora might even have a better gas tank than Spivak. Spivak's never gone five rounds, I don't think. Tybora, I believe, has been scheduled for multiple five-round main events. He was literally in one earlier this year against Tai Tuivasa. He's the king of the apex. So... I think Tybora is going to be able to outland Spivak, all right? He's not a, the best striker, but he's going against Sergei Spivak, who might be an even worse one. So, power shots, it's going to be hard to come by in this fight. I'm not going to lie. Because what's going to happen is, what you're going to see is for five rounds, strike, strike, hug, separate, strike, strike, hug, strike, strike, separate, strike, strike, clinch against the cage for three minutes. Like, that's going to be every round of this fight, in my opinion. And for those reasons, that's going to go right into Tybora's game plan. This is a very greasy heavyweight main event. I put some units, not on Tybora, but I did put some units on something, which I'll show you right after this. The pick is Marcin Tybora by decision. Now, a new addition to the YouTube video is I'm going to just show you what I bet, because I, I tell all my Instagram people, I tell all my Twitter people, might as well tell the YouTube family what I have money on. I have a unit on Damon Jackson at plus 186. I think he's a very good dog to take this weekend. I have a unit on Chelsea Chandler. This might have been a questionable play. Now that I look back at the topology percentages, I'm a little scared, but I'm going to ride with it. I have a unit on Panny Kianzad plus 162. I don't see anybody taking Panny Kianzad except this guy right here. We got a one-unit parlay on Stephanie Luciano. I think she will easily win against Talita. And the parlay, second parlay piece is Charlampas Gregorio. He should be able to find the knockout on Kazama. Then we have three units, biggest play on the card. Three units on the over three and a half rounds in Tybora versus Spivak. I think it's going to decision. And they're giving me an extra round for free. So I'll take the three units on that. And then we have a long shot, a long shot, a long shot parlay for 0.2 units. Marcin Tybora wins by decision, plus 370. Parlayed with Damon Jackson to win by decision, plus 480, plus 2626. You're welcome for the locks. That brings us to the end of another episode of Finn's Chats. I hope you enjoyed this one. Make sure you leave a like, comment, subscribe. Let me know who your favorite underdog is this weekend. And without further ado, have a great rest of your day. You savage.